and we pulled up the American Inns of Court Foundation in Durham, North Carolina, and they <coughs> give the address and the telephone number, and this particular one was contributions are deductible, and it was uh, an association, and they give the classification and the filing status, and it was non-profit. We found another one in Greensboro, North Carolina, the American Inns of Court Foundation. And it, too, was non-profit. But then we got into the North Carolina Bar Association, and it's a business league, and it was for profit. It was listed under Section 501C6. We found another one in Cary, North Carolina, and it gives the judge the head one. It gives the asset amount, and these are all group affiliations and they are in business. There's another one in Charlotte, North Carolina, in the American Inns of Court. Then there's a North Carolina Association of District Judges. Contributions are not tax deductible, and they're a charitable organization. That's what they hold them out to be. And they're a group affiliation, independent organization, or an independent auxiliary. And then, of course, they have, you know, went into a lot of them. Uh, and uh, that's when we found out that the tie to the Inns of Court of England and to the Inns of Court in the United States. I'm in. Well, actually, in uh, America, it should be America. <laughs> uh, I'm in. Let me stop yeah. you for a second, because as you were saying this, uh, lo and behold, here in Florida, there is a Tampa Bay Inn of Court. And, okay. And it's, it's T-B-I-O-C, you're going to love this, dot brinkster dot net. And on the home page, it talks about the English Inns of Court and how it all began in 1292. Right. So, folks out there, he's not blowing smoke. Go take a look for it yourself. As he was speaking, I went ahead and I did a search. And uh, lo and behold, just like you said, they come up. The first one there was innsofcourt.org, which is what you were talking about. And then if you keep on moving down, uh, you're right. Uh, you get state and regional ones that will pop up. Right. Uh, let me ask you this before we go on. Can, just can hang on to that thought for a second. I don't want to make you lose that train of thought. Okay. Um, one, this does really go back to Freemasonry, doesn't it? Yeah. High degree Freemasonry. Okay. Right. Second of all, I just want to share something with you. Uh, there is a group that's not very well known, yet it's been around for a two, uh, 103 years. Are you familiar with the Pilgrims Society? I've heard of it. That's all I have. I, I really okay. haven't delved into it. Nothing for nothing, but when uh, there's a book out there, and I was going to go to it before I spoke to you. I'm not going to worry about it. If you go and you go to Amazon and look for Pilgrim Society, there's a modern-day, uh, shall we say, biography of it, obviously authorized. Uh -huh. But in the back of it, I man, it talks about through the years, because it's one of these, uh, another one of these Anglo-American establishment things okay. that Quigley doesn't talk about, though it was there you know, for Quigley to, to speak to, and he didn't. However, when they get back to the meetings through the years of all the luminaries who came, they talk about what was spoken about, like the title of the uh, speech, perhaps. Right. But when it ever gets to any of the inns of court, like the middle inn or something like that, it right. says nothing. That's right. And people can go check it out for themselves if you want to get your hands on that book, but there is nothing ever divulged about the meetings of the Pilgrim Society in any of the inns of courts. Thanks for, so much for letting me get that in, and by all means, you know, go ahead. Yeah. Um, okay, what it is, <coughs> is um, the first uh, chancel of the Temple Church was built by the Knights Templar. All right, it's not new. Uh, it's been around for before they did it. But the Chancery and the Crown Inner Temple Court was where King John was in January 1215. That's when the English, English barons demanded that he confirm the rites enshrined in the Magna Carta. Okay? Okay. Now, this is really tricky. The City of London Temple was the headquarters for the Knights Templar in, in Britain, and where the order and the rule was first made. Now, this is going to really uh, upset a lot of people, but... <laughs> That's why we got you on. <laughs> the Vatican is involved in this big time. Yep. Now why the Magna Carta can be considered crap. And here's why. Uh, I'm going to bring up 
a particular case I was in when I sued the company when I was fired. Um, you can't use any of the Constitution and, and freedom of speech on a private company in any court. They'll just laugh you out of the court. Okay, but uh, I had bought up a particular part of the Magna Carta in the case. And I had one attorney uh, write to the other attorney, and I happened to get a copy of it. And after the case was, I lost the case, naturally. And after that, I had was privy to a document that was given to me by a, an attorney. He shouldn't have. He didn't realize what he was doing, but I got it. And one attorney said to the other, and you were worried about the Magna Carta. This puts it back where it belongs in the scrap pile. That's the exact quote. And I can remember it to this day. It goes back to 1987. And <clears throat> the reason why the Magna Carta was um, overruled is first off the the king now we're talking about the king now not the crown but the king um, was in a crusade this is in the crusade time and they was fighting with the Vatican in steps the crown the crown fronted both sides they always do in any war mm -hmm. and um, that made both the king and the Vatican, the Pope. The Pope is a figurehead in the Vatican, just like Bush is today in sure. this country. Sure, agreed. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's the Vatican regime that controls the Pope and what is the inner workings that goes on. So they had fronted the money <coughs> uh, to, the, to the Vatican and the king, and therefore they controlled them. Now, what happened was the king um, couldn't sign the document which contained the Magna Carta on the rights because a sword was held to his throat. Well, anybody today, if you got a guy coming up to you with a gun and he points it at you and says, sign it, and you sign it, that's under duress, right? Right. Well, the throat and the sword of the king was under duress. And the um, in August the 24th, <coughs> uh, 1215, the uh, Pope issued a papal bull stating that the document signed by the king was a fraud because it was under duress. And he denounced it. And that's why, uh, because he was afraid to lose his 600 pounds that was guaranteed him in the signing of this. So uh, there is one instance, and you can find this because I've gotten this from the London Library. Uh, I couldn't go there myself personally because they wouldn't allow me in, but I had a professor from Clemson University that went over and pulled a lot of these documents for me and asked me what I wanted because he was going over there. When he got there, he come back and I got the original copy of the Treaty of Peace and uh, also he was shocked when he found there were contracts and treaties and agreements made in 455 AD that are still alive and working today in the modern world. Mm -hmm. Now just think, yeah. if a treaty or a document goes back to 455 AD still has ruling concepts on today's world. There's a lot of other stuff that people have no idea exists and why they are being controlled the way they are. And if they don't have this foundation, they're forever floundering around because they can't hit the nose, nail, or, you know, the head of the nail with a hammer. It's just all over the spot. So um, 